collection of events. Uh, and we are now being recorded. Uh, we also have mentorship programs and a lot of other perks. It is $20 per semester or $35 for the entire year. Uh, fall RBB has been delayed to December 3rd, which technically makes it December, I mean, a winter RBB, what, but whatever. Um, so it is still going to be held at the same time from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. Uh, same pitch as usual. You know, you get to learn a bunch of skills, business skills, IT skills, the like. Uh, we encourage you to sign up, even if you are a beginner, because uh, we have designed this competition specifically to be friendly to beginners. Uh, you are allowed to sign up in teams of between one and four. Um, so yeah, as you can see, uh, we're in the final parts of November. Uh, today, we have Tales from the Trenches. Friday, we have a uh, headshot picture day, which is, um, it's like, it's like just like a professional like picture taking day. Yeah, professional picture taking day. So if you want to get your picture taken professionally, show up on Friday. Um, December, we're changing that uh, week to more RPB prep. So I'll be leading you guys in learning about how to script. And also I'll be giving you guys a practice round so you guys can get used to the, uh, the style of the competition before we actually have it. With uh, no further ado, here's Taylor. Hello. So. I don't know where I'm going to speak. This one, okay. So thank you, Clemens. Um, I have no idea what I'm going to be doing right now, but it seems like we have super awesome people. I'm looking at them right now, all three of them. <laughs> um, so I think today um, I'd like to give a warm welcome to Silas, Angelo, and Dennis for uh, being here as our guest speakers. I think that's it. <laughs> All right, uh, I'll go ahead and intro us off. So hey everyone, uh, my name is Silas, and uh, today we're going to be talking about uh, sort of what we do at work. Um, as you know, we're red teamers, so we kind of hack stuff. And uh, just before we kind of get started, just wanted to preface the slides. So they're going to be very informal, might be kind of funny. Fun. Uh, pretty much we want to kind of create a welcoming environment for you guys to ask questions throughout uh, each slide. So if you guys want to kind of dig into each person or ask, you know, clarification on some points, definitely feel free to do that. Uh, we were all students once sitting where you guys once sat. Uh, we know that sometimes when speakers come and they're super professional and all that, um, it kind of might be a bit uh, challenging to ask questions. Um, so we wanted to make it very easy, uh, very welcoming, uh, hence the great quality slides. So uh, with that being said, uh, again, if there's any questions, feel free to jump in. So. Uh, All right, I guess I can start this one off. Hey everyone, I'm Angelo. People call me Jello. Um, I was a student here at Cal Poly Pomona, graduated winter 2019. Um, interned at Mandiant and since then I uh, got a full-time offer and I've been working at Mandiant as a red teamer uh, for around three years now. All right. Hi everyone. My name is Dennis. Uh, people call me Dennis. Uh, I graduated at the same time as Jello and before that I was also a student at CPP, um, was part of Swift and did, um, what was it, Grand Academy. So tried to make workshops and, you know, rushed everything right before Friday. Um, and then, yeah, just working at Red Teamer at Mandiant right now. Uh, hey, everyone. Uh, my name is Silas. I am also a Red Teamer uh, over at CrowdStrike. Uh, I graduated 2019, about two years ago, three years ago. I don't, I don't know anymore, but pretty much been working as a Red Teamer for the last year. Uh, when I came out of college, I did instant response for four, five months. Um, so if you guys have questions about that, feel free to ask me. Uh, but now I've been kind of pivoting over and doing red team full-time. So, yeah. So this slide, uh, no bullets. We're just gonna be talking about um, how we got to where we are um, throughout, you know, <laughs> college um, and, and maybe, you know, everything in between. So I can um, start us off. I started, um, Cal Poly Pomona with pretty much full intent to be somewhere in the cybersecurity 
industry. Um, never thought I'd be red team. I definitely did start off, you know, with blue team background. So if anyone here is involved in CCDC, um, that's a really good program uh, where students are pretty much, you know, the, the senior students are instructing the new, new beginners on how to really lock down uh, a company from, you know, security perspective. And then, you know, that was the first year. And then I got an internship um, where it was a smaller company. Um, and there was perks in that where, you know, working with a small team, you're able to work with a lot of various departments. So, you know, I was able to um, get my hands dirty with, you know, different tools, uh, whereas other companies, you know, maybe bigger companies, uh, it's hard to get your hands on that just because of uh, business politics and stuff like that. And then uh, my second year, I did uh, CPTC. So if you guys have heard of that, that's like sort of the pen testing side of um, CCDC where you're working with the team and uh, attacking a simulated company and writing a report. So similar to what we do now, you know, we, we have clients, they ask us to test stuff and we write a report, do a presentation, and then that's pretty much it. Um, I think that's pretty much everything I have, unless you guys want to add on some more unique experiences. Yeah, I mean, um, anything you guys want to ask Silas? I mean, before you know, anything, I know this is like, a, like kind of an important piece here. I should add that. Were doing IR before, yeah. How old are they? Uh, so the question was, uh, you know, I did IR before, uh, which one do I prefer? Um, I, I think uh, just uh, the way I, I like to work and maybe my personality, I do enjoy red teaming a lot more. Uh, IR was fun, but I feel like it's a bit, um, it's a different pacing. I don't really know how to put it into words. Um, sometimes for IR, it's a hit or miss, right? Um, you know, you have ransomware cases, you, you don't really know what to do. You have blogs and you're looking at them, you're trying to figure out what happened. Um, and that's, you know, IR, um, trying to put, put together a story. But Red Team, it's more thinking outside of the box, a lot less structured, where, you know, you have this entire business and all you need to find is one flaw in their environment. And that's all you need to get in. So it's a, it's a different feeling. Um, overall, I did enjoy red teaming more. So I was pretty grateful for the opportunity to, to switch over. Um, but yeah, if you guys have questions about IR, I'm happy to answer them afterwards. Uh, there's a question in the chat. What would you say is a good way to get into the industry? What can I start doing today that can potentially get me an internship or job in, let's say, uh, the, the next, next 60 months. 60 months. 60 months. That's, That's a long, long time. Six months. Six months. Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you yeah. got a pretty good chunk of time that you don't figure it out. Like, uh, yeah. Um, you guys want to answer now? Yeah. I, I can start to chime in here. Uh, one tip that I sort of give to a lot of students is starting your own website and starting a security blog. Um, I know a lot of students here like doing things like hack the box and like doing their own research. And I think having all of that documented in a place where recruiters and hiring managers can see it. Um, I think that's extremely valuable, as well as uh, extracurriculars, like being a part of all the different student orgs that are here, like SWIFT, um, participating in competitions like RVB and uh, you know collegiate uh, competitions like CCDC and CPTC. All, having all of those on your resume just shows that you're really committed to, to learning more about cybersecurity. And really in this field, um, the goal is to just continue learning and, and never stop. So. Yeah, no, definitely do all of that. Um, get into the competitions. And um, if anyone here is wondering how you do that, um, I know for me starting out, I came from aerospace engineering. Um, so I started my second year, um, very lost, not really sure. You know, I saw hacking on TV, wanted to do it. Um, so yeah, if you're wondering how to get started, you're pretty much in the right place if you're already here, if you're joining the call. Um, just being around these people who are doing these things. Um, and kind of learning from them. You'll hear a lot of different terms from them, learn the terminology. Um, and yeah, just mainly showing up. Um, when I started, I basically showed up to the lab and I would sit there and not know anybody. Everyone seemed super buddy-buddy. You know, they knew each other, they made jokes, all that stuff. And I would just sit there. Um, if I had a question, I could ask. Um, 
And that was pretty much it. Over time, they would start to notice that you showed up more than a couple of times and, you know, start talking to you. But um, main thing is show up. And then uh, over time, you'll kind of absorb those skills um, slowly. Yeah, uh, don't think I have too much to add onto that. I think in, in summary, it's just being involved, um, especially with Swift. A lot of people in the industry have heard of Swift. So if you have it on your resume, not just as a member, I think a lot of people here are members, but uh, being involved in some sort of you know, e-board, is that what you guys still call it? Like leadership position, um, that would be a, a good thing to have. And especially just being around like-minded people, uh, maybe someone's working on a project um, you can kind of you know shadow and see what's going on. Maybe you can even contribute to it um, or or kind of pick their brain. I think that's definitely um, good advice. Yeah, you just get voluntold on the <laughs> projects, basically. Yeah. They'll need help and they'll be like, hey, do you. Um, another question in the chat. What's your experience with general programming and how important is it to your profession slash road to where you are? I personally don't have much coding experience. Um, to be honest, I don't really have any interest in learning that. Uh, there is some stuff that is helpful, um, just understanding how, you know, like a Python script works. Um, I think just being able to understand, I think is helpful, um, but I don't wanna speak for you guys. Um, yeah, so my experience with general programming before I started sort of working my first full-time job, it was mainly just, I think it's a Java class here, object-oriented programming. And um, that actually helped out a lot with um, a lot of my current engagements, which required taking a look at Java code. So I specialize in mobile application uh, penetration testing. So a lot of mobile apps, um, you can actually sort of reverse them uh, into Java code. And reading that code is and understanding what's happening behind the scenes is extremely important. So I guess it really depends on like what sort of domain you're in. So if you're more focused on like the network side, it's probably not going to be as important, but in my opinion, it still is because I think just like learning how to, to read code and write code that can help you, um, it's like pretty benef beneficial in the long run. But yeah, if you want to speak no, on your time. Oh, well, <laughs> um, yeah, no, I, like Jella said, like Sayo said, it's, it's going to be helpful if you have um, some of that experience and it helps you look at pretty much everything is going to be a script code. Um, if you want to end up digging deeper, um, you know, maybe building your own tools, understanding other people's tools, um, and especially troubleshooting, it's going to help a lot. So, yeah, overall, not required to, to be where we are. It is helpful, um, but definitely uh, by no means is it required. <clears throat> Any other questions on this sort of topic? Oh, oh that's not uh, day in the life. You want to take this? Uh, sure. Yeah, I can go with this. Um, so a day in the life, uh, a lot of people might wonder how red teaming goes. Um, basically, we'll start off with a contract with a client that, um, you know, someone up the chain set up or someone from marketing snagged, uh, you know, a victim or customer. Um, and then after that, uh, once we set up scope, like what we're supposed to attack, um, what they want tested and what they want to um, really find out about their systems, that's when we kind of get started. And then we'll start with scanning, discovering how the systems work, how they interact with each other. And then once we go through those first couple of days of scanning and kind of just trying to use the environment, um, after that, that's when the fun starts. You start trying to find um, things that are out of date, things that are misconfigured, um, trying to work your way through the system. And that, that'll vary a lot based on um, the different offerings that you do see. So depending on the contract that was signed, um, that will affect what kind of work we do. Um, but otherwise, it's pretty much just set up a contract, um, communicate with the client, make sure you know what is supposed to be done. Um, and then you just pretty much start testing and then um, take lots of screenshots, take lots of notes for the um, upcoming report that you have to submit to the client. So do, do people know what the difference between uh, what an external is versus an internal penetration test? Taylor, go on. Um, external, they're mainly like testing what's on the perimeter of the company. Internal, they would like give you some sort of access as like assuming like a phishing attack had already occurred or like a threat actor is already in the environment. So it's testing 
how secure your company is inside the wall. Yeah, that's 100% correct. Uh, internals, most of the time, they follow like an assumed breach model. So it's sort of assuming that uh, an attacker got in and uh, executed payload. And then from there, they're trying to see if they can sort of get domain admin uh, and you know achieve their objectives, whatever those objectives are uh, in the scope are. So. Yeah, so <clears throat> I think uh, one thing that's kind of interesting is to see how much um, time is allocated Right. So since we're a consulting firm, we have clients, um, they're paying us for X amount of time. We can't be doing this, you know, for, for years or months on end. Uh, externals, uh, I don't want to speak for uh, you guys, but I think it's generally about one and a half weeks of active testing. Um, and then, you know, you have reporting and then internals are two weeks long. So we have two weeks inside the environment. Um, I don't think we've talked about adversary emulation slash red team yet. Um, so every kind of firm calls it differently. Um, Essentially, it's uh, imagine a black box type test where only a few people know about the test. So let's say the CISO uh, contracts us and wants us to do a test. So what we're doing is trying to gain access organically. So whereas internals, we are you know sending an email and having a user click on it knowingly. Uh, adversary emulation slash red team is um, really kind of in the name. You're emulating what an adversary would do. So you know they're going to be assessing things from the external perimeter, trying to find you know, credentials that might be on GitHub or trying to brute force, brute force passwords for you know, their um, Microsoft accounts, stuff like that. And then once you're in, um, you're kind of going low and slow where you want to avoid detections from their SOC team, right? Since it's a black box scenario, uh, the security team isn't in on the loop. So the whole point is to really figure out um, you know, as a CISO, how good is my team um, in responding to a breach, right? Are they able to use the alerts uh, generated from whatever um, tool they have to try to figure out, you know, is there an active attacker within the network? And if so, you know, what are you going to do to remediate it? So this one's really to test out the um, client's team. And um, I think this one's our longest one. Uh, I think four weeks for us. Um, web application, I don't really do much of them, but it's kind of in the name. You're testing out specific applications, uh, web apps that a uh, client has. And then Jello is mobile testing. You want to talk about that one? Yeah, I can do a quick blurb. So uh, for mobile tests, that usually takes, it depends on the how big the app is, but on average, it's around two to three weeks. And usually most of the time we uh, test both iOS and Android. So um, at home, I have two test devices, one iPhone and one Android device. Both are jailbroken and rooted. And then from there, um, yeah, we just go ahead and test the application, both on sort of uh, testing like device storage, um, as well as interacting with the web API. And there are a lot of like other little components, but uh, mobile is sort of like in, in its own interesting space. Um, I guess the last one here is purple teams, where... Um... We kind of go in with our own blue team and then we interact with the client's blue team as well. So they're defenders, people who set up threat hunting or people who set up detections, people who are trying to, um, you know, set up firewalls so that things are protected. And we interact with them directly. And so we'll be running kind of standard red team activities. So um, different payloads or different ways of interacting with the environment that is generally considered malicious. And then we'll see if they can generate detections, uh, see how we can help them with that, um, help build out their own defenses. And yeah, that's pretty much it. And if you guys have any questions about like details or you know what a lot of this means sometimes, um, or like what actions we take, all that kind of stuff, you can always talk to us afterwards. I feel like you can kind of go into a lot of nitty gritty for this. Have you done any social engagement, social engineering or phishing assessments? Yes. Um, I was going to go ahead and talk about that in the next slide. Actually, it's one of sort of like the tales from the trenches. Um, but yeah, I'll be going into detail. <clears throat> but yes, uh, we do do social engineering engagements. They're just not as uh, frequent. Yeah. And they're often attached to our red teams as well, because it's an organic way to get in. Um. As red teamers, will you pretty much 
No, I do a different engagement like almost every month. Oh, okay. But um, I, I do spend like some free time doing research into mobile apps and sort of ask like, hey, uh, if we get any clients that want to test out their mobile apps, then I'd be happy to be put on it. So okay, it, it just happens more frequently than other consultants. Uh, when you do internal engagement for like legacy engagement, how often do you run into conceptualized uh, um, defensive software and desire to do stuff like that? Oh, almost every time. Yeah. So uh, the question was, how often do we run into uh, like defenses in internals? Uh, I think for the most part, it's every time. Um, I think there's an advantage for maybe us. Um, so, so at CrowdStrike, we have our own Falcon tool. Um, we do have a small advantage because we have the ability to test stuff directly against Falcon. We can figure out what works and what doesn't work. Um, so obviously we know sort of loopholes, um, but at the end of the day, it's not really testing out like a defender, right? Uh, or Falcon, it's, it's our job in an in internal is not to test that, um, not to test the product itself, but <clears throat> like how the uh, company's security defenses are as a whole. Um, and what I mean by that is, you know, defenders um, and Falcon and all that stuff is it's good for blocking like, you know, the generic payload. Um, but for a lot of red teaming, it's sort of mimicking how a normal user would do things, right? So if we're able to access file shares that have domain admin password, right? That, that's happened before, um, Defender, Falcon, all that stuff, they can throw telemetry at it. They can, you know, alert like, oh, maybe there's a suspicious connection here, but they're not going to block it because if they were to block every sort of low fidelity thing, then the business couldn't operate, um, right? So um we're able to do things that are seemingly normal um but take advantage of it for our own you know purposes was that sort of what you're looking for for an answer or... yeah okay <clears throat> um, yeah we'll move on then Uh, never a dull moment. So this one's going to be sort of fun stories, like very short um, things that we've all encountered um, working that kind of make red teaming fun or more fun than it is. Uh, I don't know if I'll cover all of it for time, but um, maybe I can talk about I'll, I'll talk about the first one. So um, this one's not allowed password. So during a internal uh, a couple months ago, uh, we were inside. Um, we had access to a user's account. We had off their Office 365. Um, just one of the methodology that we'll do if we have access to SharePoint. Um, and that's, that's if you guys don't know what SharePoint is, it's where sort of teams um, have their documentation. They'll put, you know, uh, whatever information on there. So think about just like general documentation for, for the company. Um, one of the things that we look for is just passwords in general. Uh, I would say 90% of the time, um, if we were to search the word password in any company SharePoint, there's going to be something um, like a username and password. Um, not always valid, but you know, um, it's something we look for. Um, for this particular client, we found uh, a document that said um, like passwords that are not allowed for the company. Um, and I, I'm not going to say the password because it's 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 going to give away who it is, but um, just imagine like CalPly Pomona, um, a password like Bronco123, right? That's like not allowed passwords. Um, so we're like, okay, well, you know, let's just spray the password because it, it seems like it could be possible, but, you know, th they say it's not allowed. Um, so for context, there's about 8,000, 9,000 uh, accounts in this entire company environment. We sprayed the password. Um, anyone want to guess how many password or accounts we have? Couple hundred, go higher. No, it, it was, I guess, a couple hundred is like 200, right? It was 850. So about 10% of the company uh, password or accounts had a password that was explicitly stated as not allowed. So that one was kind of funny. We had a, we had a good chuckle about it. We told the client, they're like, what the hell's going on? Whatever. Um, but you know, it's it's good practice to you know use password manager, right? You know, so, some stuff that we'll recommend. 
Um, you know, while, while it's funny, we, we do have to provide recommendations to them on, on how to fix it. Um, so that was one. Um, fishing forwarded, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of jump around. Uh, fishing forwarded, um, this one was sort of what Taylor was asking. Uh, do we do social engineering? We do. Um, for our adversary emulation, this is where we're trying to gain access organically. So one of the uh, ruses, as we call it, is um, tricking a user into um, entering a password um, into some fields, um, you know, like mimicking a, a login page. I don't know if you guys have done a demo for Evil Jinx before, um, but essentially just imagine your, I don't know, uh, Microsoft login page. Um, if you were to completely replicate that page and then serve it under like Microsoft online one.com, um, essentially you're tricking users into putting in the password. So uh, what we'll do is we'll mail out a ruse and then direct them to, to some interesting page that seemingly is, is normal. Um, in this instance, um, this one was for a client um, and the ruse was that they would be able to get $150 for their new um, swag shop that's that open. So a company, you know, it's it's a random company. Let's just say, you know, Cal Poly Pomona. Um, they want to showcase, you know, their their new swag shop and they give you $150. All you have to do is log in, right, to your account. Uh, essentially, we did that. Um, I don't remember exactly if we got any passwords from it. Um, but we did find out later on, and this is kind of the interesting part, is that um, we were looking around um, their SharePoint because we, we got in somehow. Uh, we were looking at um, meeting minutes. I, I don't know if you guys have heard of that, but let's just say you're like in this meeting, someone's taking notes, there's meeting, uh, there's like meeting minutes. People will say like, you know, stuff that they heard and talked about. Essentially, uh, we figured out that the person we sent the email to um, brought it up during their meeting. They're like, hey guys, like there's a swag shop and, and stuff like <laughs> that, that you guys like should probably check out. So they put it down on the meeting minutes. Um, it's kind of funny. And, I, and they actually forwarded the email to like some of their friends to like get them to click on it. Um, I, I'm sure we got some clicks. I can't remember. Uh, it's been some time, but it's just funny. Like, you know, some people will will be totally oblivious and, and they'll kind of screw everyone else up um, in the business. So that one was, was pretty funny. Uh, and then I guess... Yeah, I'll let you guys talk about some as well. Yeah, I just wanted to add on to that. Uh, for social engineering, phishing, like free swag works like 80% of the time. Like people want mm -hmm. free stuff. So like sometimes I would use, um, what's that site you can use to make free? Uh, yeah, I use customing. Custom and I'm like, hey, you get like this free t-shirt with your company brand. You get like a hydro flask and you're like, Oh yeah, let's go. So yeah, half half of our time, like working hours, might sometimes be just like on custom ink or like designing a website to make it look good. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> just anything. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so graphic designers. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> Good job. So uh, yeah. So moving down the list here, um, this one's a pretty interesting one. It's uh, finding critical risk, privilege, escalation vulnerabilities. Uh, this I was on a particular web app um, for for a company and. Um, essentially we had two privilege, two different privilege accounts. We had a lower privilege account and an admin account, and you'd be surprised with, um, how simple some of these vulnerabilities are. Um, so I noticed that there was an admin menu where I can like add, delete users, et cetera. It's an extremely sort of like powerful privilege to have within the application. And what I did, I just opened an incognito window and logged in as the lower privilege user force browse to that endpoint. And it accepted my author my authorization token, and I was able to sort of change like pretty much any user uh, users role on that website, delete users, add users. I thought that was um, pretty critical for for like what it was, even though it was like such a super simple vulnerability. So, do you want to you have any other stories? Gosh, um... I, I can continue talking about like other stuff if you want. Think of some. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll need a minute. Yeah, these aren't these aren't my bullet points. <laughs> yeah, sure. So the next bullet point that we have here is being an APT uh, against a cybersecurity company. So um, another cybersecurity company um, contracted us to do a red team against them, and I thought it was going to be like impossible. Like, how can you hack a company focused on cybersecurity? 
So the first thing we did uh, was that we wanted to get in organically. So that was through social, social engineering. Uh, we did try, um, we did try uh, fishing and uh, I don't think any of it was successful. So we decided to go with fishing. Um, so we gathered, uh, we did OSIN and we gathered pretty much all the phone numbers of the people that worked at that company. And then we created sort of like a, a script that we can improv of, off of. And essentially what we, uh, we were impersonating an IT help desk person. Uh, so we searched up uh, an IT person that worked for the company on LinkedIn and we, we impersonated that user. We used, um, we used a built-in, I, I forget the name of it. It was like a built-in Microsoft uh, meeting program. And essentially all the uh, victim had to do was enter in our code and that would give us remote access to their machine. And then from there, um, so yeah, we, we made the call. Actually, um, I was uh, I was on a phone call with my intern and he wanted to, to do the call. So um, the intern called the, the victim and posed as IT and uh, proceeded to, to say, hey, um, this is Steve from IT. Um, can you go ahead and open up this program and enter in this code so we can you know, share screens and collaborate? And this net, like super nice old lady was like, oh, sure. <laughs> and uh, and yes, yeah, he was just like, yeah, don't, no worries. We just need to update some stuff on your computer. It'll be like super quick. It will take like two minutes. And she's like, oh yes, of course. And I was, I felt really bad, but. Um, <laughs> she get fired. She did not get fired. <laughs> um, but essentially uh, he just, uh, we, we sort of took control of our computer and we, uh, executed our payload that was hosted on uh, on one of our domains, and then from there we got we actually got in to that cybersecurity company uh, through social engineering. So that was pretty interesting. Um, and then from there, uh, yeah, our next step was to since we had valid domain user credentials now, uh, we actually ended up dumping the credentials off that uh, user's workstation. And then from there, um, you know, we did reconnaissance, did did uh, sort of gain situ situational awareness of their environment. And our next step was, was getting domain admin. Um, and this was mainly, this was done through an Active Directory misconfiguration uh, dealing with uh, Active Directory certificate services. I'm not sure if anyone has, has heard of uh, ADCS or using certify, but it, it's becoming a more common vulnerability uh, within Active Directory environments. And uh, yeah, we were able to, to do that to, to gain domain admin. And then from there, we completed the red team objectives, which involved like um, compromising their, their code pipeline, um, gaining access to people's mailboxes, and um, and yeah. So so once we got domain admin, it was it was sort of sort of a simple process of figuring out who to target and, and whose credentials to steal, and then like sort of stealing their cookies and gaining access to um, potential sites of interest. So so yeah, that was one of the the red teams I was. I was on recently. Well, um, let's see. I guess you guys did ask how uh, was it how important general programming is to to our work. Um, so a lot of the times, we need to script something. Um, for example, I wanted to do a password spray against this one uh, web page, and it had it had a couple extra protections. Like there were things you had to click on before you could get to the actual. Um, you know, prompt for the password and username and everything. Um, so I couldn't use some like just generic tool off GitHub or anything like that. And so I decided I would uh, script my own. Um, sadly though, I ended up flipping the for loops because I put a for loop within another for loop. But instead of, let's see, basically I mixed up the password, the password field with the username field. And so what ended up happening instead of, you know, instead of taking, uh, one password and kind of hitting a bunch of users. So each user gets just hit just once, right? Mm -hmm. Instead, what happens is that I end up taking a user and I would hit them with like 15 <laughs> passwords straight and they would get instantly locked out. <laughs> and so um, basically um, I was working with one of my buddies on this project and he had taken off for dinner. He was like, yeah, uh, I was like, yeah, no, you're good. Go on, enjoy your dinner. Um, I've got it all covered here. Um, <laughs> and then he called me and he's like, bro, I just got a phone call from, from, you know, our manager, like, uh, what's going on over there? Like, are you running anything? I'm like, no, I'm just reporting. I'm not running anything at all. And I'm like, wait, I'm running one thing, but it shouldn't be a problem. <laughs> um, so it turns out I'm systematically locking out all their users. <laughs> um, 
And then, yeah, basically the client gets really mad and I just spend, I have to spend the next week just kind of keeping my head down, um, you know, waiting for news back from my manager, who's having to like kind of diffuse the situation with the client. But um, yeah, so is general programming important? I, I do think so. That's a good point. Also, um, if you're ever doing any password sprays, just like test it out with one user. <laughs> because like, I, I've heard a lot of, a lot of stories about um, whole companies getting locked out and you know, that's really bad for business, so. I, I really wanna know what, what ukulele is. Oh, okay, that's fine. So this one was uh, essentially after our engagements, we'll have what's called like a status update, um, kind of wrapping up everything, talking about all the findings we had. So for a bit of context, we had a client um, and you know, generally like clients will do you know, on a scale of one to five, they're usually three. This one, they got pwned pretty hard. Um, a lot of just um, common stuff, low-hanging fruit that we're able to abuse. Um, so we're, we're on a Zoom call with the client. There's probably like 10, 15 people. There's, there's a lot of people on, on their company. Um, some people with their cameras on. And uh, there was this old man um, who was working at the company and while we're doing our status update, he just pulls out a ukulele and just starts playing it. He was muted, granted. Um, but I was like, what is this guy doing? Like, does he not care about any of the things? Like, whatever. Um, I looked on his LinkedIn afterwards and he'd been there for like 30 years. So I figured he's probably going to retire soon or something like that. But it was just kind of a bit, like I've never seen anything like that uh, where, where a guy's just playing a ukulele on Zoom during a status update while they got home so i don't know the guy was interesting um yeah that, that was it i wish there was more but that was, that was it <laughs> do you have any interesting sort of like client interactions I I, do you have the most interesting client interactions um no not kind of mind. <laughs> yeah um, if we think of more we'll yeah we'll go through but i think we do have some real stuff to talk about um um, yeah um okay so real talk reconnaissance uh which is like the first step when it comes to sort of any uh, pen test or engagement is super important so knowing how to figure out what the uh target environment's uh assets are is super important and making sure that you have sort of the whole landscape uh mapped out um, yes, yeah, so I guess just to clarify, this, this slide is going to be just talking about like stuff that we run into pretty common um, in environments. Uh, the next one, and we'll kind of try to go through this a bit quicker, uh, abusing application functionality. This one is just um, interesting because it's something that uh, at least I'm noticing a lot more commonly is any open source or commercial applications, um, they have some functionality that is probably not documented, right? So if you were to like attack like FTP or whatever, that stuff is well documented. They'll tell you what versions are vulnerable, stuff like that. Uh, but sometimes applications itself have built in uh, features, we'll call them features because they are features for like the end user. Um, but for a red teamer, you kind of have to um, think outside the box. How can I use abuse this um, to get to what I want? So for example, um, there was an insurance company that had their sort of in-house web application. Um, essentially what they do is they'll take in like insurance claims through some API, they'll go through it. There's a way to filter stuff. Um, there's ways to automate the process. And uh, one of the things that I found was that there was the ability to run um, what's called GOSU code, um, GOSU, G-O-S-U. Essentially, it's like very similar to Java code, which I kind of later found out. And essentially, what we're able to do is because it's pretty much uh, running Java, um, you can run commands on the underlying system. Um, you can import some libraries and run commands. So although you know this application's uh, functionality wasn't to run code on the underlying system, um, by really digging um, into what each thing does, you're able to um, abuse the system and get, you know, further access. So just something to keep in mind, you know, if you guys are doing hack the boxes or some other stuff, you know, definitely look into each application, figure out 
how it works um, from like an end user perspective, and then think about how you can abuse it, um, you know, to get what you want. Active Directory is a gold mine. Um, hopefully, you guys all know what Active Directory is by now. If not, it's never too late to start learning. Um, essentially, it's you know a, a way for it's like a, a big database for organizing company uh, assets, resources, people, stuff like that. Um, a lot of the time, I'd say maybe 50, 60 percent, which is kind of scary. Um, Active Directory, like you can store users' descriptions, so you can say like, "Oh, this user works in what field?" Blah blah. Um, a lot of times, uh, IT people will be lazy and they'll store their password in a user description, and then you can use that account, move elsewhere, find out where there's admin stuff like that. So, Active Directory is definitely one thing that will, I'm sure, all of us check for on internals, um, and then like. Jello mentioned uh, Active Directory Certificate Services. If you guys haven't heard about it before, definitely recommend reading uh, Spectre Ops. They have a, a really detailed blog about um, the misconfiguration. And it's essentially like if you have an account, if you have any, like, I don't want to say any, but uh, usually if you're starting off with a, a user account, um, you're able to escalate from your standard user to any user, including domain admin within Five minutes, right? Like the, I think the, the time that takes the longest is reading through the templates and analyzing what's wrong. But this one is is crazy. Um, it's it's been very popular. I know for for red teams, um, weak passwords and overly permissive ACLs. Um, yeah, like I like I mentioned, people have really bad passwords. Um, password one two three. Uh, all a common um, password that will spray against is the like season that we're in and the year. So like summer 2022, like I'm trying to see if anyone's passwords are that. No one seems surprised, um, that's good. Uh, overly permissive ACL, so that's similar to file shares. So um, one of the biggest things that, um, or most common I'd say uh, for any company is uh, exposed file shares, right? So let's say, you know, the a department wants to have their files accessible to others um, via, SMB, a lot of times we'll find passwords in there. We, we have a, a, a process in automating um, the search for it to just kind of flag on certain keywords, um, you know, password.txt, stuff like that um, is, is very common. And I know, at least for me, there's been a few times we, we get straight to domain admin just because of someone uh, posting their scripts with a password in plain text. And uh, last part is in Jello's. Oh yeah. So um, during engagements, I reference uh, Twitter a lot and blogs. Um, it's a goldmine for things like click scripts, uh, methodologies, and sort of setting you on the right path when it comes to testing. And yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I guess the last part is sort of what stops us. If you guys are curious, um, multi-factor authentication can be a killer sometimes. Um, strong network segmentation. So let's say, you know, we, we get on a system. Can you go? Okay. Uh, sometimes we'll get on a system and we want to access the server. Um, certain firewall rules prevent it. So we have to kind of figure out um, how to pivot over. Uh, good EDR products can, can stop us. Um, and then threat hunters for sure, you know, people who are actively trying to hunt us down. Um, and then finally, good configurations, you know. Obviously, we, we'd all want that, but um, you know our job is to identify misconfigurations. Um, I think that's pretty much it. So, so this last part is just uh, if, if you have any questions, uh, now would be the time to, to ask. You guys have to talk to Dennis and Sarah. Let's have a meeting in like 10 minutes. <laughs> yeah, um, you guys can catch us in the lab later probably because we don't want to be driving around all day. So we'll probably try to get some work done. Um, you know, we're still working. Yeah, so we'll probably wrap up here. I think uh, well, 50 is a good time and then we'll be around for questions. And then at one, we'll probably head over to the lab if you guys haven't been. So thanks everyone. Yep, thank you. <laughs>